According to uh, a sutta called uh, Dhamma Chakka uh, Pavatana of the Theravada school, the Four Noble Truths is the first sermon of the Buddha. The first time when Buddha uh, talk about the Dharma, that's the Four Noble Truth. So according to history, after his enlightenment in uh, Buddha Gaya, uh, the Buddha went to Varasani, and on his way, uh, he met his former companions, the five ascetic monks in the deer park. When the five ascetics met the Buddha again, they thought, oh, this person, we know him. He abandoned uh, our ascetic practices, we should just ignore him. But as he came by, they all felt something special about him. So they stood up to make a place for him to sit down, and he delivered his first sermon on the Four Noble Truths. So that was the first sermon was delivered to the five ascetic monks um, in the deer park in Varanasi. So there are some people in here who may think that, oh, Four Noble Truth, you may have heard about it. Oh yeah, Four Noble Truth, beginner stuff. It's so simple. That's the basic. They always think that, oh, that's beginner stuff, that's basic. We should learn something more advanced. Why get back to uh, the Four Noble Truth? But let me tell you, the Four Noble Truth are a lifetime's reflection. It is not just a matter of realizing the Four Noble Truths. They require an ongoing attitude of vigilance, and they provide the context for lifetime reflection and contemplation. You know, just, just, oh, I know the Four Noble Truth, and that's enough. No, you have to reflect on it. It's just like every day when you go out, what do you see? You look at the mirror, look at yourself. You use that mirror every day to reflect on you. You need to look at it. So it's worth going through again and again. And what are the Four Noble Truths? The first Noble Truth is that life is suffering. Life means suffering. Life is suffering. Even if we consider ourselves happy for a while, sometimes we feel happy, but this happiness is transitory by nature. The second noble truth, now the first, you know the first, life is suffering. The second noble truth is the origination of suffering. The suffering in the Sanskrit language is dukkha, D-U-K-K-H-A, dukkha. So if you read sutras, it, it, suffering means, uh, the Sanskrit for suffering is dukkha. So the second noble truth is the origination of suffering. That means we must know the causes of suffering. The third noble truth is the cessation of suffering. That means we can end suffering through, through uh, niroda. What is niroda? It's relinquishment of your desires and craving. If you get rid of your desire and attachment, you can end suffering. That's the third. How about the fourth noble truth? It's, it's the method or the path to end suffering. So you got this four. So actually, at this point, you can, we can think about it. What is Buddhism? Buddhism is not that the Buddha demand, demand, demand uh, obeisance, demand blind faith, demand your, your belief. And then the, the Buddha gives you blessings. That's not Buddhism. Buddhism wants, a Buddhist is an investigator. Investigator of what? Of life. He's a researcher of life. A Buddhist wants to know more about life so that he can practice it and improve on his life. Not just faith. Not just prostration and chanting and burning incense, burning candles and bringing flowers and offerings. Not that. That's just the peripheral part of it. So you are the, if you, 
you, you practice the Buddhist teaching, you are a researcher of life. Research into the meaning of life, the weight of life. You investigate into why. Why do we have all these? Why inequalities? What's the meaning of karma? Why are people, they are different. Our fates are different. So what is this no, Four Noble Truths? This Four Noble Truths indirectly tell you that, oh, the Four Noble Truths is to find out more about life. First of all, it's a truth that life is suffering. We'll investigate more into it. Why? Life is suffering. And then the second is causes of suffering. So you can see it's very analytical. Now, assuming that we all have a common sickness, the sickness of, of suffering, of craving, of attachment, um, the first noble truth said, life is suffering, identification of the sickness, that common sickness, identify the sickness. The second, causes of suffering, a diagnosis of the sickness. The third, cessation of suffering, affirmation that the suffering can be healed, the sickness can be healed. Fourth, path or the method leading to the cessation of suffering. That's the medicine, the cure that will stop the suffering. So this is all analytical. It's like a, like a, like a doctor prescribing medis, medicine to patients. Nothing about blind faith, nothing about superstition. That's a good example. Patients, doctor, and medicine. So, Let's get more into it. Four Noble Truths. What are the Four Noble Truths? The first Noble Truth says that life is suffering. Human nature is, 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 is not perfect. And neither is the world we live in. The world, nothing is perfect. The world is imperfect. And during our lifetime, inevitably, we... we uh, we have to endure physical suffering. What are these things? Pain, sickness, injuries, old age, tiredness, and eventually what? Death. And some people say, no, life is not suffering. Life is happy. I feel happy. I got a job. I travel. I got money to spend. I have an apartment. I have a car and all that. And why are you telling me that I'm suffering? Because you, because we're ignorant. We don't even know we're in suffering. When death is always confronting you, how can you be happy? When you know that your life is going to come to an end. When you know that there's always a final curtain for your show. How can you feel happy? Not only the final curtain for you, for your beloved ones. How can you feel happy? The Buddha didn't feel happy about that. He wanted to find out a way that there's no suffering, there's no death. You don't go through rebirth. So the first noble truth, life is suffering. Not just physical suffering, Psychological suffering, which is even more serious. What are these psychological suffering? Anxiety, disappointment, fear, frustration, sadness, and depression. These are psychological sufferings. Although there are different degrees of, 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 of uh, and, or extent of suffering, and, and, and there are sometimes happiness in experience in life, but ultimately, life in its totality is imperfect, incomplete, and transient. Nobody can argue about it. Life is transient, fleeting, impermanent. And according to um, um, a sutra, Samyutta Nikaya, that's the, of the Theravada school, and I quote directly from there. I just read it out to you. Uh, birth is dukkha. 
D-U-K-K-H-A, dukkha is suffering, right? Birth is dukkha, and dukkha is a Sanskrit word for suffering. Birth is dukkha, aging is dukkha, death is dukkha, sickness is dukkha, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are dukkha. Association with the unbeloved ones is dukkha. Separation from the loved ones is dukkha. Not getting what one wants is dukkha. In short, the five clinging aggregates are dukkha. What does it mean? Now, you know, birth is dukkha, the suffering, you know. Why is birth suffering? You carry karma into this world, your own karma. You get reborn into this world. You have no choice. It's not Buddha who determines where you're born. So always maintain those three philosophical questions in your mind. Where did I come from before I was born? Why did I get born here? What's the meaning of life? You gotta find out these. Where did I come from? Do I suddenly have this present life? Is there a chain, a continuity? Where would I go after this life? Why did I get born? What's the meaning of life? The significance of life? Are you not going to be interested in this kind of questions? Or are you just, you know, like a robot, uh, putting in food, putting on your clothes, and getting a job, getting a family, and finally death? Every day you get busy. Busy partying, talking on the phone, doing a job, studying, going to university, caring for your kids, getting married, or getting a divorce, or finally, home is broken, or go on, and finally, death. Is that what life is all about? If, if that's what you accept, it's not enough. It's not enough. So, you know, birth is dukkha. Aging is dukkha. Death is dukkha. There's no denial on that. Death is dukkha. Sickness is dukkha. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are dukkha. But how about association with the unbeloved ones is dukkha. Association with people you don't love. Associating with things that you don't like. That's suffering. I've met a lot of couples who, 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 who didn't get a divorce yet because they have children that bond, that bind them together. They don't like each other. The, the, the love already just dissipated one or two years after marriage, after the wedding. They have children and they can't do anything about it. They want to keep the children in and they're not happy about it. They go each other's way, but they still keep the family going. And there's association with unbeloved ones. That is suffering. You live with someone you don't love. Or you work in a company that you dislike. Or you cooperate with colleagues that you hate. Isn't that suffering? Your colleagues always backbiting, tattletelling on you. You are insecure. All these is suffering. Your brothers and sisters, you think your dad is it, it, it's, it's manipulating favoritism among the, uh, the boys and the girls at home? You hate your dad or you hate your mom? Or you hate each other? Of course, there's always sometimes love. So separation, association with the unbeloved ones is suffering. On the other hand, separation from the loved ones is suffering. People you love, your mom, your dad, they passed away. You are grief stricken. You love your dad, your, 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 your mom so much that you always want to stay with them. But one day, that day will come. Of course you don't feel happy about it. So that's suffering arising from separation from loved ones. Now, this suffering, not getting what one wants is suffering. Your desire, you have insatiable desire. It does not matter how rich you are, you always have desire that you cannot fulfill. Talk to the billionaires, you ask them, are you happy? 
Have you got all, since you have billions of dollars, have you got all your desire fulfilled? No, he said. So what is your happiest moment? The happiest moment that I have is I can get a, an ice cream cone and lick it and I'm walking in the park enjoying the trees and the flowers. That's my happiest moment, but I don't have that. Everyday meetings, and, and I always have to, to deal with my affairs. I'm not free. They're billionaires. And you think billionaires have all the money in the world, they can fulfill every one of their desires? No. No, it's not true. They always be interviewed by in magazines, and they always release information about happiness. Don't you read about them? But then you say, oh, this guy, he wants to have a walk in the park, and that's happiness. I walk in the park every day, I don't feel happy. Because your definition of happiness is not the same. You want material, you don't have money. You want money, you want struggle. Your definition of happiness, your longing for that kind of happiness is different. It degrees and extends are different. So, these are the specifics of suffering, but on a macro level, they are also suffering in relation to, to, um, to the environment. The first is suffering in relation to unpleasant environment. What is that? Suffering in relation to unpleasant environment? Natural disasters, earthquake, tsunami, hurricane, flooding, drought, and so on. Natural disasters, suffering in relation to unpleasant environments. Typhoons in Southeast Asia, for example. Flooding and all that. And there's also suffering due to human conflicts too. Historically, we have the Holocaust, killing millions of people. Genocide. Riots, civil wars, international war. The First World War took away 40 million people's lives. I forgot the figures for the Second World War. So are these not sufferings? So there's also suffering caused by impermanence. Nothing stays the same. Everything is changing, transitory. But you like to add, grasp onto it. And you can't grasp it. You always want a happy moment to stay. But there's no banquet that does not disperse. That's a, that's a Chinese saying. There is no banquet that the people don't disperse. Have you, come, have you gone to any, have you been to any party that they never say goodbye? The happiest moment will end. There's no party in which the participants don't have to say goodbye. There's no show that does not have a final curtain. When the final curtain is drawn, you'll be singing my way. You're defining it when the final curtain is drawn, not before. You still have that egoistic feeling that, what did I do? Oh, I've done this, I've done my way, I'm good. That's still the egoistic feeling. It's the ego that pulls you down. Anyway, so no matter how hard you try, your happiness will finally come to an end. You're talking about the formation of a family. You started with yourself, one person. And then you match with another, you get married. Then you have a family, a couple. And then later you have kids. One and two or three. And then you feel happy about it. The kids growing up, of course, in between the problems, growing, you know, feeding a family, educating the kids and all that. Assuming that it's, it's a, it's a closely knit family, it's a good family that everybody relatively feel happy. You know, there, there's problems to resolve. I haven't seen any families that do not have any problems resolved. So, you start with one person, then you have two, your spouse. 
And then you have a son, a daughter, and all that, and then you have a family of, say, five or six. As the kids grow up, they get higher education, and finally they leave you. And what do you end up with? Two again. And then you get rid of the house and buy an apartment because you don't want the maintenance and repairs. And then finally, you've got only one left. So you start with one and you end up with one. Actually, to, to put it the right way, but you start with nothing, you, you end with nothing. How do you come to this world? You come to this world naked. You didn't bring anything with you except your cry, your first cry. You crack out that cry when the nurse hit your, your butt top. You, you, you came to this world with a cry, exhilarating cry, and you, let, you leave quietly when the, when the last breath is exhausted. That applies to everybody. I'm not pessimistic. It is a truth, the Four Noble Truth. There's no denial on that. And some people will say, oh no, I don't like to hear that. On a Saturday morning, I want to hear something exhilarating, hilarious. I want to say something happy. I don't want to listen to this monk talking about death, grief, sorrow, pain, <laughs> suffering, and all that. So, you're very pessimistic. You're negative. Negative. It's because of your understanding of the negative aspect of life that you become more positive. It's because you understand the pessimistic side, you become more optimistic. Because the Buddha, the prince, Gautama, Siddhartha, he knew that life is suffering. He wanted to find out more about getting rid of the suffering. To find out, to resolve your problems, you really have to understand your problems first. You identify the problem, don't you? You can't say, oh, you're identifying the problems. I don't like to hear the problems. They're pessimistic. They're negative. No, you are... You're, you're like an ostrich burying your head into the sand, assuming that the hunter is not going to get you. You really have to find out your problems, my problems. The world is imperfect. Neither are we perfect. So we'll find out why do we have this imperfection. That's what the Buddha said. So because we understand the problems, we can resolve them. We're not trying to avoid a problem. It's not negative. Because you know the negative part, you start to be more positive to change it. That's the idea that Buddha brought to us. Understand the hardship and the suffering of life so that you can improve on it, get the cure for it, heal it, and get into affirmation. Get to the affirmation of Niroda, Nirvana. Get away from rebirth. Get away from samsara. No more reincarnation, no more life and death, no more sickness, no more aging, no more death, no more association with unloved, beloved ones, and no more separation with loved ones. None of that. None of that exists. A nirvana. So, that's the... That's the first noble truth, suffering. So what is the second noble truth? Now we recognize that there's suffering. What is the second noble truth? The origination of suffering. What does that mean? We want to find out the causes of this suffering. Very scientific, very logical. You identify the problems. It's like the Harvard case studies. You're given a case to, to, to analyze. You identify the problems first causes of the problem, make recommendation, get a conclusion. That's a Harvard case study approach. That's what the Buddha is using 2,600 years ago. So, 
The second noble truth is the originating instrument of suffering. And what are the causes of suffering? Causes of suffering? Craving, anger, ignorance. You think we're intelligent, actually we're ignorant. Descartes, remember Descartes said? The Apollo God, the philosophers, heard that the Apollo God said that Descartes is the most intelligent person on earth. And this philosopher told Descartes, oh, Apollo God said that you're the most intelligent person in the, in the whole world. And Descartes said, no, I'm not. And then Descartes pondered and pondered about what Apollo God said, and, and he got it. He said, oh, Apollo God said I'm the most intelligent because I know I'm ignorant. I know I'm ignorant. So I'm, maybe that's the reason why I become the intelligent person. And he started looking in the market for people. I'm looking for people, and everybody in the market say, hey, you are crazy. You're looking for, looking for people with people standing everywhere. No, he said, I'm looking for people who know they are ignorant. We don't acknowledge the fact that we're ignorant. So, let me tell you a story about ignorance, about greediness and, and attachment. Just to um, bring a little bit of interest in, in the talk. Do you know how the farmers in Southeast Asia catch monkeys? They catch monkeys to, to work for them, climb up to coconut trees and get the coconut for them in Southeast Asia, in India, in Thailand, and in, uh, in Burma, and in, uh, in Malaysia. How do, they, how do they catch monkeys? Monkeys are difficult to catch, you know. They're jumpy and, and they're quick, you know, they're fast, and they're ferocious. You try to catch them, they're going to bite you. They're ferocious. How do they ca catch monkeys? The weakness of the monkey is that they like bananas. Monkeys like bananas. So the farmers pick an empty space where there's no trees, no shrubs, so that the monkeys won't ambush in it. The monkeys won't hang onto the tree branches and they can get away. But if they catch the monkeys, if there are trees around, you kind of, try, kind of try to catch them, they just jump up the trees. So the farmers try to, would, would, would pick a spot where there's this open space, and then the farmers would put 30 to 50 coconuts on the ground. These are not ordinary coconuts. These are large, huge, heavy coconuts. And they put coconuts on the ground. These coconuts are special, you know. What, did, how did they, what do I mean by that? They drill a hole inside a coconut just to fit a banana, and they put the banana inside the coconut hole. You see? Banana, they put a hole, a long hole, and they put the, the, the coconut, they make a hole in it long enough, then they fit the banana inside. And it's so fitting that you can put your hands in, but it's difficult to pull, pull the banana out. So they put the coconuts on the ground, and, and, and the farmers go back to the shrubs behind and hide in ambush. They, they wait for the monkeys to show up. And then after a while, a monkey showed up. He sees some coconuts in there. His nose is trying to get closer and closer, and he's... And he sniffed and he smelled, the, smelled bananas. So he peeped into the hole and said, oh, here's a banana. It's a waste. I should get it. But monkeys are group animals. They, they, they live in groups. They go back, they go back to their you know, families, to their society, to tell all the other monkeys to come. So suddenly, after that monkey is gone for another half hour, here is. 30 monkeys showing up. They're all trying to get the coconuts. So they hold the coconuts in their hands and they put their little hand inside to grab the banana out. But they can't because they're so tight. So they don't know what to do. They're struggling with the, 
banana inside and they're struggling with a heavy baked coconut. They don't know what to do. And at this juncture, the farmers behind in ambush with the nets all coming up to capture them. But at this moment, the monkeys still can get away because they're holding the coconut, they're putting their hands in, they can always withdraw their hands and they can jump, you know, as quick as they want. But the bananas are so delicious to give up. It's the ways to give up bananas like that. So delicious. They attach to the bananas because of the attachment and their craving. They lose their freedom. They become enslaved by the farmers on chains. The farmers put chains on their neck and train them to climb coconut trees to get coconuts for them for the rest of their life. So that's the plight of a monkey who attached to delicious bananas and didn't let go. Not even at the final moment when they have the chance to let go. They don't want to give up. Attachment, attachment, attachment. Are we humans better than monkeys? Think about it. What kind of problems we run into? We get mad every day, we get jealous every day, we get greedy every day. We make a mistake more than one time, two, three, four, five times. How do drug addicts become addicted to their, to their liking? They grabbed onto it, they didn't change. They're not better than the monkeys. In a lot of ways, we're not better than the monkeys. We disdain, we despise these monkeys who hang onto bananas. But are we not acting in the same way? That's craving. That's attachment. So, we are always craving to satisfy our senses. When you come to think of it, why do we crave for something? Why do we attach? Because we want happiness. We want to be happy. How do we define happiness? We define happiness in terms of the satisfaction that we have in our mind. The satisfaction we have in our eyes, in our ears, in our nose, in our tongue, in our body. We de- this, that's how we define happiness. We want to feel satisfied with all the senses that we have. So, so the eyes want to see beautiful things, want to be attracted to the charm of, your, of the opposite sex. The eyes. I haven't seen a person who, 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 you know, their eyes, they don't want beautiful things. Of course, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. Everybody's beauty, the definition of beauty is not, is, is not the same, but you're always attached to, to your to what you term, quote and unquote, your beauty. You want that. Your eyes want to see that. Ears want to listen to dulcet or pleasant sound. Music, you always want to, you always, your ears always want to listen to good sound. You don't want to listen to criticism. You don't want that. You don't want people to curse and yell at you because you don't like it. Your sound, your ears, you don't like it. You only like something pleasant. That's your ears, your nose. You always want fragrance, perfume, good fragrance. Your tongue, you always want the best taste, best food. Your body, you always want to, 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 to have a tactile object to touch. You want silky object, you your body, you want to be in comfort. So you want to satisfy your, your, your eyes, your nose, your ear, your taste, your tongue, your body. These are the five sense, five crude senses. These are, the, this are the, uh, the front end salesmen of your body. They are the doors. 
You're, you're using this salesman to satisfy your company body all the time. And finally, of course, you have this mind. The mind, the mind is the central control. The mind is the principle, and all these other five senses are only the accomplices in the karma formation procedure. So your definition of happiness is, is the satisfaction of your senses. But first of all, satisfaction of the senses is transitory. Second, is that what you really is that what you mean by happiness? Is happiness just satisfaction of your senses and that's it? As a matter of fact, this sense is getting you into trouble. I think, I, I'm sure you can think of, about a lot of examples where your senses get you into trouble. So, you have the craving, the attachment, the anger because of ignorance. Your body, your mouth and mind carry out the actions. So what did your body do to, to carry out the action? The body do what to carry out the action? The body kills, the body causes injuries to others, the body steals, the body commits sexual misconduct. This is what the body is doing. Body means bodily action. You do all this action that forms karma. You don't know the meaning of karma? You check it up, that's a very important concept. Your body brings that karma to you, and you create that karma from what? From killing, causing injury to others, stealing, sexual misconduct. What did the mouth do? The mouth? The mouth slanders, lies, curses, equivocating, tattletelling. Oh, the mouth does a lot of bad stuff. And what did the mind do? Greediness, hatred, and all that. The mind originates thoughts of greediness, anger, and ignorance. Now, greediness and, and anger are easier to understand. Greediness is desires and craving. Uh, anger, you know, um, hatred, they are easier to understand. The one is ignorance. Ignorance is actually, we call it the, the three poisons that bring you to karma, it's what? It's, it's greediness, anger, and ignorance. Greediness and anger, it's, you understand. But ignorance covers a lot of other unlimited varieties of mental afflictions. It, it, it uses just one word to include all. So what is this mental afflictions? What ignorance produces mental afflictions? What is mental afflictions? Jealousy, hatred, arrogance, enmity, parsimony, negligence, fraudulence, negligence. It's ignorance. Drunken driving is, is negligence. Fraudulent. In a company, fraudulent. Stealing, lapping, oh, you name it. Fraudulence. Shamelessness, restlessness, Distraction, deception, love, and torpor. All these are terms that describe mental afflictions, and we all have them. So we're talking about the causes of suffering, the second noble truth. The causes of suffering, we can go on and on. The four noble truth is a one-month course. Talking an hour per, per day, you need about 30 hours to really analyze it in detail. The cause of causes of suffering. First of all, you identify suffering, recognize it, and then you find out the causes of it. If you know the causes of them, then you know how to eliminate them. So this mental afflictions arising of ignorance, the list is inexhaustible. I can carry on and on and on and on. 
So these are causes of suffering and our, our mental afflictions, which are unlimited, and we can, we, we can categorize them, but we don't need to do it in here because it takes too much time. Um, these afflictions, however, instigate us to perform unwholesome deeds, and that's why we have unwholesome karma. Remember karma, we have three categories of karma, wholesome karma, unwholesome karma, and neutral karma. The, the mind... The mind helps you not just to do unwholesome things. Sometimes it could good deeds, wholesome deeds, virtuous deeds. So the mind is the forerunner of all behavior. So that's why we're meditating. Why do we come for meditation? We come for meditation because we want to know our mind. Now you know the objective of meditation. Why do we come for meditation? Just watch the breath in and out. Just sit like cross your legs, your postures, or when Lee is talking about the postures, the free adjustments, that's to help you to understand the mind. This is a method. Meditation is just a method helping you to understand yourself, to understand your own mind. When you understand your own mind, that means you identify your suffering, you're mindful of what you're doing. We are not mindful of what, what we're doing most of the time. But if you understand, if you become mindful, I said when you circumambulate, don't define things. Don't say, this is the red lantern, this is the floor, and that guy is in front of me, and this guy is carrying a perfume around. And uh, oh, you're defining everything. You're not mindful of what you're, what you're doing. Why are you mindful? You want to be mindful of what you're doing so that you won't do the wrong thing. So if you're mindful, you know that, oh, I shouldn't be drinking when I'm driving. No, this is wrong. Of course, your mindfulness has to be supported by morality. You know what is wrong and what is right. Now, that is the fourth noble truth. Method to end suffering. Method to end suffering, you need morality. One of the fastest ending suffering so this is just the two aspects that I've been talking about. You first, you be mindful of the suffering, of the causes of suffering. If you're not even mindful of that, you're not on your way for spiritual development. 